thing about the Ironman World Championships uh, is, you know, if you qualify, you just never know. You never know what's going to happen in your life. You never know if this is your last shot. I got out of the water, looked at my watch, 53 minutes flat, uh, which was about a three minute PR for me. Body felt great. Onto the bike, feeling very strong, and then it got ugly on the run. The fatigue caught up to me and I just, I'm like, you know what? Everything you want is on the other side of fear. And triathlon taught me that. You know, you look at this feat and you think of this thing as, as impossible. This was my second Ironman in nine weeks. It is what it is. I am just blessed to be here. Take it in, have fun, and whatever you do, Darren, don't walk. Yes, it's a very competitive sport and we are competing at the highest end of the sport, but at the end of the day, it's still a hobby and family comes first. I don't miss a breakfast table. I don't miss a dinner table. There are a few Saturdays where I'm probably missing for a few hours, especially you know leading into an Ironman build where it's a little bit more intense. My dad was a major influence on my sporting life, very competitive. He did triathlon for quite a few years and he did an Ironman and he was the guy that sort of got me involved in triathlon to begin with. My first Kona, I, I know, you know, he was watching from above because he knew how, how big that race was. I dropped some ashes in, in Kailua Bay. Uh, for him, and uh, you know, I have this epic shot of me coming across the finish line, pointing up to the sky. It's a lot of work, uh, but I think the rewards for me personally, it, it keeps me sane. It is a critical time for me, especially my early morning runs. That's where I gather my thoughts. That's where my the creative part of my brain starts to work. And I will come up with campaign strategies and ideas and, and different things that, that you know I will be working on in a few hours once I hit the office, out there in the dark with a headlamp on, running alone with my thoughts for an hour before work. And it's something that I've become dependent on. I, I need it, I like it. The night before, I, I lay out my stuff, my headlamp, my gloves, depending on what time of year it is and my iPod, and it, and, it, and it gets me excited to go to bed because I know that I'm gonna be rolling out of bed at 4.30 or 5 or whenever it is and going out and getting that alone time um, before I come into the craziness of making the kids breakfast and getting, getting everybody, helping my wife get the girls ready for school um, because once I come back in that door, it's go, 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 go. morning. When you make the choice to, uh, you know, be an endurance athlete, whether it's a triathlete or a runner or a cyclist or whatever, 
you know, nutrition plays a, a huge part of that. For me, it seemed like every year my diet got a little bit cleaner, a little bit more clean, and you start feeling better, you start having a little bit more energy. And then for the last couple of years, I've been sort of refined as far as an athlete goes. Competing, we say there's there's four elements to, to Ironman triathlon. I mean, there's swim, there's bike, there's run, and there's nutrition. And nutrition is just as important as any of them. While I'm training, it's interesting. I mean, it, it, you, know, you can be out on a long run and for me, as soon as I'm on that long run and or a bike or wherever, whatever it may be, as soon as my mind starts to go negative, I start thinking about just negative things. That is my like predictor that my glucose levels are down. And I'll reach and I'll grab an agu and I'll ingest that and it's like magic. It's, it's that instant, the sugar, I mean the way they've put these things together, it literally within 60 seconds you're like, your mind's back and you're feeling better and that leg that was you know giving you trouble or you know you're wanting to walk is you know that sensation is gone ready up My first experience in Kona was, uh, you know, quite a bit shocking. I mean, you get there and it's it's 2,000 of the most fit people you'll ever see in your life, and you're looking at these people going, "Holy crap! I mean, this is no joke. This is Type A, just mecca. You have 60 countries that are represented. They're the best of the best. It's the Mount Everest of our sport. It's surreal." Anyone who's going there knows it's the World Championships and obviously wants to be their very best on race day. Uh, depending on your, your life schedule, I mean, some people can train up to 25 hours a week. Can you think about that on top of your everyday job? And if you have a family, it's a big time commitment. Mentally preparing for Kona is, is something that I think that we probably do 365 days a year. I mean, especially once you qualify or if you're that person that's on the cusp of qualifying. Um, I, I, I think that if you were to talk to an athlete and, and they told you that during a training run they don't envision themselves in Kona running down on Leahy Drive, they'd probably be lying to you. I mean, I do all the time. Kona 2016, I'm just super stoked to be back there. Just knowing how cool this is gonna be, doing a few things a little bit differently. I, I'm super excited to go over there and just have another awesome day. Tomorrow is going to be full of thrills. Treading water in Kailua Bay uh, with helicopters overhead, Mike Riley talking and just taking in the moment is, is unbelievable. It's definitely probably the most exciting part of the actual race is that anticipation, that getting ready to go when that gun goes off. Right before the gun goes off, these athletes have never felt more alive. There's something that's just different about that race and other Ironman races. It's electric. I think all athletes that aspire to race Kona, they're just goal setters in life. Crossing the finish line there, it's just the completion of, of a huge goal for you, for the people that have supported you and believed in you. I think it's just a huge sense of accomplishment of competing. And I think also a sense of gratitude because being involved in this sport, you know how many people are dying to be on that start line. Kona is an Ironman like all others, 140.6 miles, um, but you're basically doing it in a sauna. You never ever know what you're gonna get with Kona. It is so weather dependent. The elements play such a big factor in that race. I mean, that the elements are the race. So Ironman starts with a 2.4 mile swim, um, then you hop on your bike and it's a 112 mile bike ride and then it finishes with a, with a marathon, 26.2 miles of running. It's a little bit like a boxing match at the very beginning of the swim, and they let us out so early into the swim start corral that you're sitting on the start line for anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. As you get closer to um, the cannon going off, there's a lot of elbows and kicking and yelling. There are thousands uh, of people just walking and jockeying for position to start this race. And then 
other Ironman swim, you might spread out a little bit and kind of be by yourself. Here, you're just in a pack the whole time because there's so many strong swimmers and no one's gonna give an inch because it's Kona. You're getting knocked in the chin, you're getting knocked in the head, you're constantly rubbing shoulders and losing strokes because you're just getting cut off. So it's there's so much advantage to be in that pack that everybody's trying to fight to, to stay in that pack. You then hop on your bike and for the first eight mi miles you do kind of a loop through town that feels as though it's lined with spectators. It's an exhilarating feeling being on your bike at that point of the race. Then you make your way to the Queen K Highway and you don't come back to town for another 102 miles. That's where you feel the elements start to be a major factor in the race. The heat, the winds up to Javi. When you make that turn from Javi home, A, you're psyched because you're headed home, even though you still have 50 some miles to go, but the winds are crazy on the descent. You're literally riding sideways, like leaning into this wind. If you look at the athletes ahead of you, they're not straight, they're like this. The run is really, in my mind, you break it into two parts. You run 10 miles on a leaky drive along the water. You'd feel maybe you'd get a nice breeze from the ocean. No, it's so hot. You run out five miles and the, you know turn around and come back straight back into downtown. No shade, there's no breeze. It is just a heated cauldron of, I mean, it, 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 it was miserable. Getting to Palani, which is the, the road that comes and takes you up to the Queen K, it's a steep hill. And I just remember going up this thing going, I don't want to probably go finish this race. Once you make that turn back onto the Queen K, you know you have about a 10K to go, about six miles. And that's when you sort of start uh, at least mentally processing the finish line, although you have a long ways to go. And those miles, anybody will tell you a marathon is two races. It's the first 20 and the last six. And the last six are brutal. Back in to town, um, onto Polani, that's where it starts to get magic. You know, you have crowds on both sides, six, seven deep, just cheering and yelling. It's surreal. Coming across the finish line at Lee Drive with, um, you know, Mike Riley calling out your name and saying you are an Iron Man is the epitome of you know reaching the top for I would say most athletes. That's 
what limits so many people in their thinking is, oh, I can't do that. Yes, you can. The lessons I've learned in triathlon and Ironman specifically in training and, and pushing yourself to the limit are boundless. It transforms everywhere. Whether you're having a conversation with somebody on the street or you're in a high-level meeting uh, with a client. When I say I push myself, I push myself in business too. I say a lot of things that I, I never would have said just to see what happens. 95% of the time it's positive and the other 5% of the time you walk away and you learn something. But the whole mentality of changing things up, looking at things differently, pushing yourself to the edge is applicable everywhere. When I say everything you want is on the other side of fear, which is a Jack Canfield quote, not mine, it's true, you have to push yourself. You have to become comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's just the way life is. If you want to grow, you have to test yourself. You have to walk right up to that edge and peek over it. Sometimes you fall off, sometimes you go too far, but you're never gonna know where too far is if you don't go out and test yourself and see where the edge of that cliff is. Thank you.